Midday, heat, stillness. The sea below the walls of Troy barely moving. The sky vast and unblinking. No one stirs. Only Achilles, who sits motionless close by the tide line, his head bare, his eyes. Half closed in prayer. I pray that Troy will never fall. Let it stand until the end of history. Ten years I have fought for it here below the walls under Agamemnon's leadership. Ten years of stupidity, waste, and failure. Oh, mother. O、oh, my Creator, hear my prayer. I am your son, Achilles, your miraculous boy. My father is a mortal man, but I claim descent from what is oldest and most permanent—the sea itself. You are a spirit of that element, Thetis, daughter of Zeus. Let your power be my power. Agamemnon has stolen from me my favorite concubine, a creature, dark-eyed and lovely, assigned to me by common custom as a prize of war. He does me this shame out of envy and out of spite to show the world that he is strong and to punish me for being what I am. Your son, the greatest ever born, and knowing it, and saying it. Now he weeps, and as he weeps, the ebb and flow of waves upon the shore brings back to his afflicted heart, somehow, the memory of his mother's arms, how she would rock him asleep and sing to him, in a low and soothing voice, her songs of sleep and forgetting. Sometimes in the noonday heat. Or the silence of the night, he hears her voice speaking inside his skull, like a cry which is never released. Oh, my son, why do you weep? A man of power betrays your trust, and you're surprised.、Hmm. I know what men like Agamemnon are. Your father, Peleus, was the same. A soldier, an adventurer, a brave, bone-headed, violent, aristocratic thief. He ransacked Troy when Heracles was general, then came home rich, intending to live a good life, but had no woman of his own. Hearing that I derived by birth and beauty from the eternal gods, he swore to make me his wife. He hid in a cave on a beach. And when I came down at dawn to the sea's edge to swim naked in shallow water, he followed, resolving to take me by force if necessary. Soon his hands were at my thighs, his lips at my breasts. I fought back using all my magic arts. I became in turn a fish, a bird, a crab, a unicorn. But your father made proof by his desire against the pain, held on to me tight. Through all the straining transformations, there was no gentleness in those thieving, grabbing hands for me, as he raped me repeatedly at the edge of the water. Later, when his force was spent, I had my revenge. I let him believe I had come to love the body which had violated me. I used him selfishly、mm. for my own pleasure, as he had used me. I bore him a son, you, Achilles, the greatest ever born, a son such as any father, any king would dote upon. Yet before you were old enough to possess the power of speech, I stole you from his house, rearing you in a forest where he could not corrupt you. I love you for your power, 
your beauty of fall. In the day's heat, your limbs gather gold from the sun, but your nights are dark with bewitching dreams. Oh, mother, life is short, but the reward promised to me was honour. It was foretold of me in my cradle that I would not live long, but in my brief time I should win for myself fame and renown beyond mortal limits. Accordingly, out of duty and for love of honour, I bound myself under the command of a man, Agamemnon our king, who was in every respect my palpable inferior. I knew there could be only one commander-in-chief, and he must be obeyed. Otherwise there is anarchy. So, I obeyed Agamemnon, even when he was wrong. Now, I receive my reward for the years of service I gave unstintingly to my king and overlord. I am treated like trash. Oh, mother, when I was told what he had done, my heart blood tightened inside me. My head filled up with waves of sound like sea or horses' hooves. I left my tent, came out into a world drenched in light, so strong I had to shield my eyes against the dazzle of the sand. Then, as I have known them do before, light and noise fused, somehow became one image. You stood in front of me. Oh, Mother, when I hear your voice, see, my head rocks with pain yet what I feel is love immense unnatural serene oh child by ancient arts I have created you my own even at your birth I knew you would grow stronger than your mortal father I bred you strong so you would always hear my voice wherever I should be, mm. in the sea or under the earth, or up in heaven with the ever-living gods. As for Agamemnon, whom you hate, remember, Troy is your opponent. He is not. By fighting him, you diminish yourself. Take your revenge, if you will have revenge, as I took mine, patiently, by stealth, not letting your enemy know your thoughts. Not letting him see your pain. God will teach him manners, my son. Mother, there is no God. And once a man is in the earth, he stays there. The life goes out through clenched teeth. It does not come twice. When I die, your voice dies too. What you have said, I hear, my son. Your gift of certainty is wonderful. But do not disobey the gods or me. Mother, I do what I must do. Anger has its own lord and its own time. Let whatever powers there be in sky or earth give me revenge. Let Agamemnon suffer. yourself, Achilles. You are dearer to me than a brother, closer than blood, but this rage of yours has power to ruin us all. Agamemnon must not find you here, weeping on your knees like a beaten schoolboy. He must see you as you are, as the army knows you to be, their champion, resolute, immaculate uncowed by adversity or the insolence of authority. What news do you bring, Patroclus? Does Agamemnon come to my tent? Will he explain openly to my face why he has done me this injury? Yes. He is coming. He knows that you have spoken violent language against him. He knows he has to show that he is not afraid of you. 
Is this the god-mad Achilles who falls down at noon to listen to the stones on the beach? Who puts his ear to the water's surface or hears in the movement of the wind above the sand divine voices? I think it is not the gods, but his own unstable nature which stings him into this madness, this rage. The army loves him, Agamemnon. What you have done will earn you nothing but their contempt if you persist in it. They know Achilles is always at the forefront, always leads, and he cares nothing for his own safety. To have seen him fighting is to have seen a god in action. Menelaus, you are my loyal, steadfast brother, and when you speak I listen. But you are deceived. This is no god. This is a proud man, unable to tolerate the knowledge that there is one above him whose authority exceeds his own. Why do you steal from me, Agamemnon? Why do you persistently quarrel, Achilles? Answer him, Agamemnon. The girl you stole was allotted to Achilles by acclamation as a prize of battle. I feared that in his rage he would kill the soldiers you sent to abduct her. But Achilles is a man of honor. Friends, he answered them. It is no fault of yours that our king behaves like a common thief. Patroclus, you are this man's comrade in arms. In you he places all his trust. I do not ask you to approve the action I take. I ask only that you understand why I took it. I had a girl of my own. I loved her more than I loved my own wedded wife. But she is the daughter of a priest of Apollo. And in reserving her for my own use and pleasure, it seems I put to scorn the laws of God and laid violent hands upon his consecrated messenger. As a result, this priest has used his art to call down against me and the forces I lead the enmity and anger of heaven itself. My brother believes it is not hard to recognize in our failure to achieve what we have attempted against Troy the signs of divine disfavor. Accordingly, he has renounced the girl he loved and made restitution to her father, the priest. But it is not fitting, Achilles, for a king to have less than his lieutenants. Old custom of war gives me first choice in everything. So you take from me by theft what you cannot win by prowess. Do you ask me to acquiesce in what you do? I do not ask it, Achilles. I demand it. Do not criticize me for making a test of your obedience. Everywhere it is whispered that I take orders from you. I know where these stories originate. The army is rotten with faction, infected with rumor. Accordingly, you will submit yourself to my authority and recognize the power which I hold over all men. I am tired of your contemptible behavior. I am tired of your vanity and greed. You are unfit to be commander-in-chief, unfit to lead men into battle. You fight as you have always done, not for honor, but for your own personal gain. Are you not ashamed that this sum of your soldiers have died in their hundreds, eating rotten meat, drinking contaminated water, while you ate well and slept well, tucked up in your tent? You bestow upon yourself the title of commander-in-chief. Yet you do not lead by example as a general should. Name any in this war who has paid a higher price than I have done. When the gods made a test of my faith, I delivered up my own beloved daughter, Iphigenia, to her death. I swore I would give anything to bring the army safely to Troy, and the gods did not doubt I told the truth. They spoke through their priest, and I obeyed them. Do not lie, Agamemnon. You put no faith in gods. You did it to seem strong. You knew that if you treated your own daughter as you did, then you would be feared and obeyed. Prophecy was given openly and in public. And when the army heard it, you will remember how they howled for her death. I could not repudiate it. The will of the gods is harsh, not gentle. Often it is needful for us to suffer. She suffered. You did not suffer. The night after she died, I drank heavily, then sank into a deep sleep. I woke before it was light. There, in the darkness... 
child was sitting with worms in her hair. When I tried to cry out, her mouth opened. A snake crawled from between her lips. The face was not the face of Iphigenia. It was not human. Brother, you have had the hardest task of all, but you will succeed. You are stronger than you think. Remember, two days after she was killed, the sea went flat, the wind blew from the west. This is what the gods had promised. You are a good soldier, Menelaus, and an honest man. I do not quarrel with you. But Agamemnon, your brother, is unfit to lead. Accordingly, I withdraw myself and my men from under his command, my decision to take effect at once. Understand, Agamemnon. I want you to suffer. You have suffered too little. Discover for once where your actions lead you. Then you will regret what you have done. I regret only this, Achilles, that I ever judged you fit to serve under my command. Speak, Patroclus. You say nothing, but your silence accuses me. You act intemperately, as you have always done. Many who applaud you now for what you do will despise you later when the consequences are known. I do not care what other men think of me. I do not need their good opinion. You are stubborn. When it is known in Troy that you have quarreled with Agamemnon and refused to join battle, Hector or Hector's men will try to burn our ships. Hundreds who honor your name will die trying to prevent them. They will die, Achilles, because of you, but this I guarantee. Agamemnon will not be one of them. Who are you trying to hurt? Who are you trying to punish? I need to let my anger out. Someone must be hurt. Look, wind and tide are stronger than any human hand, yet mortal men have made themselves master over the earth, not by bodily strength, but by the power of their own will. We dam the river, we fell the forest, we take the lamb from the sheep, the egg from the mother bird. If we were not proud, vengeful, contentious, quarrelsome, what progress would we have made? Does the stag in the wood raise a temple to the god? Does the eagle in the air build a city or make a law? I have seen a man die when he lost the will to live, and I have seen a man become like a god, because it was his will to act as the gods do, without pity, without fear, without conscience, without restraint. If you love me, Patroclus, show it now, and stand at my side. Do not mistake me. My love for you is not the same as flattery. And my regard for you does not mean serving you on bended knee. There are virtues other than courage. The art of graceful compromise is one of them. Do you not see how certainty in you exhausts us all? No sooner are Agamemnon's orders promulgated each morning at our assembly than you are on your feet denouncing them. No man who ever lived on earth can give his best under the lash of this, this perpetual criticism. Love, you often say, is unconditional. Should I applaud you, then, for doing what is selfish, base, or wrong? Should I pretend to have no mind, no thoughts for fear of hurting or offending you? The strength I have, Patroclus, which you and others choose to impugn, is not harshness or rigidity, but the knowledge of the truth. Give me your armor, your shield, and your sword. Why? What will you do with them? I will fight in your place. Achilles, or the image of Achilles, must protect the army. It is said that on the field of battle, the sight of your helmet is worth 500 men. Then take it. Take my armor. Take whatever you need. You know I can deny you nothing. Fight tomorrow if that is your decision. I love you, but I cannot help you. 
pray heavens that you return safe. Spies brought news shortly before dawn that Achilles and Agamemnon have quarreled over a girl. The girl had been allotted to Achilles as a prize of war, but Agamemnon has requisitioned her to his own use. <laughs> the spies say that the quarrel cannot be mended, but therefore Achilles is certain to withdraw from the fighting. Oh, at last, the wind blows down from heaven, from the gods themselves, which will carry us to victory. We have spent ten years in limited, defensive skirmishes, avoiding pitched battle, waiting for their strength to fail. Now, our patience is rewarded. Our patience, brother? My patience, you mean, or Troy's or Priam's, not your own. Long ago, you advocated total war, and I opposed you then. Do you renew the argument now? I hear you say, finish the war conclusively in one bold stroke, drive them into the sea. Idiot. That is what they desire most, to draw us out like ants from our confinement and then to destroy us under our own walls, like ants. My men have often asked, why do we never give battle? Why does Hector, our general, prefer to fight sitting on his ass? I answer because Hector cares too much for Trojan life to see one drop of Trojan blood shed on Agamemnon's behalf. It was not us, it was Agamemnon and his men who chose to fight. Let them do the dying. You say let them do the dying, brother, but we are the ones bleeding to death. Troy was great when Trojan scope was limitless, when Trojan power reached wherever it pleased. But Agamemnon's blockade has closed the world to us. Many have said that Troy grew rich not by war, but by trafficking and trade. But how is the sea kept open? How is the market kept free except by force or the threat of force? I grant we are still able to eat well and drink well, to sleep upon soft beds. But let us not call this meagre achievement freedom or victory. The truth is that for ten years we have grown weaker while our enemies have grown stronger. That is why they say in the streets that Priam is a sick old man, unfit for office, and Hector, his son, a magnanimous fool. My shoulders are broad, broader than your own. Opinion will not weaken them, my son. I know how long a war has lasted. Do you think because I am old that I cannot count? What does it matter if it lasts ten years, or a hundred, or a hundred and fifty, so long as at the end of it our enemies are destroyed? And if the war cannot be won, if there is no place for Trojan values in a Trojan world, then truly I am content to die. Men become slaves when they prize their lives above their liberty. I hate this talk of defeat. Defeat is a state of mind. Father, there is a chance for victory. Now, Hector must act. Why, Paris? Why must my husband act to keep you safe? Go back to your bed and the woman Helen, whom you call your wife. You both say that men do not go to war over women. They go to war for reasons of their own. But Helen is the cause of it, whatever you say. If a war could have been won, then it would have been prudent to fight. But I know these island tribesmen. I have seen them and how they live. Hard as the earth, drawing strength from the earth. I came to Troy an orphan. My father, Etienne of Thebe, was a good man. He ruled a peaceable kingdom, conducted himself without vanity or ostentation. Achilles assassinated him in the 24th year of his reign at the instigation of Agamemnon, who had sought an alliance which my father refused. We woke that morning to chaos and fire. My father died first, beheaded at his own hearth, then my brothers were dragged naked from their beds. I hid in terror under a table. Achilles showed no mercy. I take no prisoners, he screamed. I am implacable. Next, he called every servant out, fifty men and women, onto a grass lawn by a statue of Apollo. Lie down, he bellowed at them. They all lay down. He drew his two-handed sword its blade radiant in the light, and opened each throat to the air. I have not forgotten how the bodies saturated the grass with their blood, how they stank of fear and their own excrement. Do not try to tell me there is any dignity in death. I only know that to fight this man, this death-mad Achilles, gorged on blood, you must yourselves become... Crueler than men should be. Andromache. 
It is not yet day. Why are you out of your bed so early? It is too hot to sleep, Hector. Even at dawn, there's no wind, no relief from the heat. The boy wouldn't settle. He was crying, so I went to him and fed him. He's sleeping now. It is worse for them, bivouacked under the stars, rising each daybreak sodden with dew to see the shadow of our fortified walls thrown gigantic across the level sand. The image of their failure never leaves their sight. No, it is worse for us. Agamemnon's men are professional thieves. <laughs> if they suffer defeat, they do not stand to lose their homeland. To them, the word warfare means no more than opportunity. What would you have me do? End the war. Send Helen back. Send Helen back? We tell them only that we're too weak to fight. They will stay to see us destroyed. I am determined that Troy will emerge from this war the greatest nation on earth. She will be undisputed sovereign over land and sea. There are times, Hector, when your bravado fills me with disgust. Life is so short. It leaves the body so fast, yet you talk as if men are immortal. I have seen you armed head to toe in bronze, coming fresh from the field, your sword blooded, your mantle filthy. But brave men can be stupid, Hector. Each day you dare the gods. Oh, fool. Sooner or later, in some situation you have not foreseen. Achilles... Or some other man will cut you down. Achilles, whom you fear, is not an enemy to me, Andromache. He has broken with Agamemnon over the theft of a favourite concubine. I have often said his loyalty is not to country or to king, but to his own vainglorious insanity, and so it proves. It's true, Andromache. Achilles has left the fighting. For the first time in a generation, the advantage is ours. What will you do? Attack, as we must, while our advantage holds. Let's see the beaches cleared of Greeks. I am a sober, cautious man, but my brother is right to say that while the Greeks remain, Troy is no safer than a boat in a storm. When Paris took me from Sparta, I remember we made anchorage at an island called Cranai, beneath a sky threatening rain. I undressed for the first time in memory alone, with no servants. I wore rough sailor's cloth. I remember when I kissed Paris in the dark, his body would not stay still. It moved under my hands. He took me ashore in a boat, which let the water in. <laughs> he sat in a puddle as he rowed, and when I laughed at him, he leapt up like a baboon <laughs> and stopped my mouth with his kisses. I think I grazed an elbow, shouting, slower, slower. And as he came, bang, the thunder came too. Godlight arched across the bay. The cliffs shook. The clouds split open. They pelted arrows of water onto our delighted bodies. Paris twisted round, shaking his fist, then he dived over the side. Then he came bobbing to the surface a moment later, grinning with shells between his teeth. We passed three days and nights on the island of Granai, sleeping and making love, eating cheese and black bread, drinking only goat's milk and rough local wine. As the bird flies home to its nest, as the soul returns at last to God, so the spirit in love finds and receives the beloved. This 
is your hour, Hector. Today, you are top of the world. But be sure of this. Tomorrow, you die. <laughs> Everywhere I go, men turn their eyes from me. They try to hide their tears, but I can see that they are weeping. What news do you bring? None of this? Patroclus has fallen. He is dead. Hector cut him down in the fighting by the ships. Patroclus came out, immaculate in your armor. He fought courageously, but Hector was not fooled. He knew Patroclus by his voice. He killed him with a single spear thrust. He has stripped the armor from the body, taking as trophies the helmet and the shield which you gave him. By the time we reached him, Patroclus was already dead. I closed his eyes and wrapped his body in my cloak. I thank you. What you have done, I shall never forget. I told him, do not fight with Hector, protect the ships, fight a defensive action, but he ignored me. I am to blame. Patroclus died because he loved me and would not see my reputation suffer. I sat alone, intractable in my anger, a dead weight on the earth. He needed me, but I would not stir to help him. Agamemnon insulted you. Your honor was at stake. No, it was my fault. It is war, and the chance of war, Achilles. If heaven and the gods loved us and were just, there would be no war. We would live out our lives in gentleness and peace. But we are men. We are upon the earth. And on the earth, we live between the hammer and the anvil. Therefore, we must be strong. If we're not strong, then we earn no respect, and foreign nations will trample upon us and destroy us. If we're not strong, everything we have, everything we love, can be taken from us. I hate what war does, the misery it brings to families, the deaths of those who hoped only to fill up their days with quietness. But war is a justice of a kind. How else can we try our strength against each other? As we must, as we are compelled to do. I know what it is to grieve. I have loved, as you have loved. There was a time when all I lived for was to lie beside my wife and rest my head in her lap. But what we love, others envy and will take from us if we let them. Now, you know what is spoken in every village. A man must be able to defend himself, or he is not a man. To fight well, to cause others to fear us, is not ignoble or cruel or unjust. It is the only safety we know in this world. You are Achilles, and by your great strength many are protected, and you are accounted a god among the living. It is right you should mourn Patroclus, whom you loved. But remember when you mourn. Be stronger for what has happened. Master your grief. Make it into a weapon. You are right. The blame is mine, but Hector will pay for what he has done. Good. 
I will have the body washed and brought to your tent. Oh, Patroclus. Some habit of my senses tells me I will see you again, but my heart knows it is not true. I cannot believe I let you die. You paid for my disastrous petulance with your dear life. <laughs> oh, my son, my miraculous boy, lovelier to me than the evening star, rouse yourself, do not weep. I am ageless, immortal, and I know that grief, like beauty, does not last. Remember that in sleep and in your dreams, the sorrow which you fear on earth does not abide. What hurts you now is only the pain of being human. Oh, my son, have you forgotten the mania which gripped you only a short time ago? The fury you felt at Agamemnon's insolence, the anger inside you detonating like the sun. Your prowess makes his expedition glorious, yet he treats you like some vexatious boy. For this you hated him so much you cried out in your rage to Zeus, the father of all things. You spoke, and the gods themselves heard your voice and heeded it. Now see, your prayer has been answered. The Greek army is defeated. Agamemnon himself utterly humiliated. Why do you complain? Patroclus is dead. Oh, mother, I am weak, weak as a mouse now that he is gone. I fear that my mind is no longer whole. It is true, the Zeus and the gods gave me what I wanted, but, oh, mother, the price of it has been terrible. Above me, the sky turns its familiar, exhausting circles. Day sky, night sky, moon, stars. Higher, there is only silence. Silence and an immense darkness. For me, there is nothing left under heaven except length and shadows. I am like a tree splintered by the axe. Oh, child. Remember the songs I sang to you when you were a boy? I taught you often how Heracles, the greatest of mortal men, pushed back the sea, raised upon his shoulders the infinite sky, and made the winds and waters answerable to his voice. Although his life was harsh and seemed to him composed of suffering, he suffered it alone, sparing others the extremes of pain. His strength was absolute, his heart like leather. So must you be now. You speak the truth. Heracles blazed like a comet. He might have lived another way, but who then would know his name? The scream of pain when he died will be heard a thousand years. Take up your sword. Arm yourself for the battle as I shall instruct you. I did not rear you to see you sit tonight squandering your strength and weeping like a girl. You were not born to hug happiness like a pillow and hoard the drawn-out years until old age. Take Hector limb from limb. Cause fear to spread in front of you like fire. Let your pain speak one last time. I agree. You are right. Tonight my enemies sit in Troy rejoicing at what they have done to me. Hope rises from them like smoke from flame. I shall not sleep till Hector's face is crimson pulp, until his flesh is jackal food. But mother, let me never hear your voice again.
Do you remember, Hector? How late we slept the morning after we were married. <laughs> it was midday before we woke. I remember how the sun stood vertical in the air above us. How light fell into the room like bars of gold. Under the sheet, my skin was red where you had gripped me. It was so strange. So new for me to sleep beside a man, his body naked like my own. Oh, the warmth, the smell of you was overpowering. Do you remember? I remember. For the first time in memory, there were no servants to disturb me. The day was mine to command. Look, Orion has said the stars are fading. Time lies heavy upon me. What will I do when you are dead? Oh, Andromache. Why must you talk of death? Because I've seen so much of it. I'm tired of bathing your wounds, of washing blood from your clothes, of seeing new marks imprinted upon your body. I live in dread of death, but it seems you and Achilles are infatuated with it. Pity me. Pity the child. Who else defends us if you are killed? Can a dead man come up out of his grave, his sword in hand, to protect the family he has left bereaved? Some say honour is best. Some say wealth. Some say most enviable of all is to die bravely for home, gods, country. I say it is best to be alive. To sleep without the fear of danger. To wait to sunlight, food, liberty. Even a slave knows that to feel sense and motion in a living body, to taste the air, to observe the bustling world, is to be like a god beside the eternal dead, who feel nothing and have no knowledge of any condition except silence and darkness. Think how much more I know it, Andromache. Am I not young and in good health? Have the gods not blessed me with the love of a loving, beautiful wife and a baby boy who is as pretty as a star? But what kind of man would Hector be if Hector said, I am afraid, death is terrible, I dare not go out today? You have always been too noble, too honourable. You cared too little for things which were real and tangible. But for my touch, for your son's embrace... Will you fight and die for the destiny of Troy? Oh, fool! Troy has no destiny if you are killed. Ten years I fought and led the fighting under our walls. In all that time I never lost a battle. Woman, where is your faith? You are mistress of my household. Do the work of a woman. Talk no more of warfare and death. How then shall I remember you? Remember me as I stand here now, armed, in good health, prepared, sober, of good cheer. <laughs> Master your fear, Andromache. Master it. I think of you and all you are to me and weep. I imagine you dead. I remember how you slept warm beside me in the bed. Death is not like a lover's warmth in sleep. Death is not warm, but hard and cold and deep. I think of you and all you were to me. And weep. Listen to an old man who has seen much. Choose your ground. Yes, you must face him someday, but why today, my son? Why, when the mad blood drives him on, you did not make this war, I did. Go out another day. Choose your ground. Be prudent today. No, oh, father. For ten years we have delayed. Let us end it now. 
We've slept too long, have endured too much at their hands. I am your son. Where the king leads in peace or war, the nation must follow. You are old now. Your bodily strength is almost gone. Yet, twenty years ago... <laughs> you would have done what I must do today. The god of war is here. I see his sword bleeding in the sunlight. On his helmet are bloodied feathers. His shield is a curtain of blood. His face is tender and ash. I see you, Hector. I see you clear as the owl in the dark spies the mouse, shrinks the field to heat, softness, blood. Use words to frighten children, not me, Achilles. You spit out hatred like a girl. You weep for the life you have wasted here on our shores, squatting with your back to the sea. The gods are harsh. They do not pity you. For ten winters and ten summers they have kept you out of the Ten long years. I felt no anger for you or your father, but I am angry now. Everything in my life which was beautiful and good you destroyed. I know you, Hector. I have seen you close. You have not the metal to withstand my rage. As for your body, when the life is gone, I will give it to the carrion birds. Let us exchange blows, not words, Achilles. I've fallen. I'm pleading. Why do I feel nothing? O oh, heaven, O oh Lord of light, receive me into your kingdom. I love the old rough gods of fields and wells and glades and streams. You can see the divinity in such things. When I was a child, I worshipped the light and hated to be kept away from it. I thought that the gods were harsh and bright and remote, that they looked down but took very little notice of us. And when our time is over, I thought we will go back to them. Why is everything happening so slowly? Why is there no pain? When we are dead, we will run in the rivers and glide in the sunlight and move with the wind over the various surfaces of the earth. We will be part of everything about us in resin and oil and wood smoke and charcoal, in everything we taste and smell, in the dust and the noise and the heat and the rain. Movement will no longer be constricted. Thought will be wordless and free. People are picking me up. I have no feeling of it. Why can I see nothing above me except shadows and light? If there is no divinity in the world, then everything we have found here has been wasted. I'm covered in blood. And yet I feel nothing. The sky is all there is. What's happening to me? It's cold. There's distance and distance and distance. There's no heat from the sun. My eyes are closed and I can still see. I'm full of light and noise. I want to scream. Oh, my child. Oh, my son. Oh, Andromache. My wife. Achilles then put aside his helmet, and calling upon those who were of his party, he took the body of Hector, which, being now bankrupt of life, he cut it with his sword at the heel, and putting through the flesh a thong of leather in this wise, he stitched the carcass to a rope, and bore it thus behind his chariot. 
which all the long afternoon he drove it about the field, not stinting at all his labour or fury. And as he went continually by, boasting of the high deeds he'd done that day, the dust from the ground rose about him in the form of a cloud so that the sun itself seemed to suffer an eclipse for the light of it burned indistinctly like a furnace through the fog and filth. And in this fashion day passed into night. Yesterday, you wore an old linen tunic under your armour. Last night, when you came to bed, you threw it in a basket, ready to be washed. It was stained with your sweat. Warm with the smell of you. Today, when I knew you were dead, I went to the basket. I took all the clothes which you had discarded. Oh, I buried my face in them. They will never be washed. I will keep them forever. Warm with the smell of you. Oh, Helen, if I ruled in Troy, I would cast you out to beg your way home to Sparta. Every man who falls in this war dies on your behalf, but no woman would die for you. We see you for what you are. The killer of our children. The murderer of our husbands. If you'd made me pregnant, I would have wanted so much to be pregnant again and again. And then you would have hated it. And then I would have lost you. Why? Why would you have lost me? So often it ends with children. When you die, when you are killed, I shall be taken to see your body. And it will lie there, in front of me, completely still, naked, as you lie in front of me now. <sighs> we will all die, Helen. Yet to me, death is inconceivable. The thrush in the thicket does not sing forever, but meadow and woodland pour forth the same songs until the end of time. The stag in the forest is killed by the huntsman's arrow, yet its kind does not perish. And the lark, which dies this winter, flies as it has flown for a thousand centuries. <laughs> I am the heir my father longed for. If I had been born his eldest son, I would have kept Troy and held it. I would have reared its young men to be violent, domineering and cruel. Now it is too late. If I die, if I am killed soon as you fear, I pray that the gods will change your shape. I pray they will transform you. Into what? She is dead. She died many years ago. Tell me who she was. Her name was Inoni. She loved me without selfishness. She wanted nothing for herself, only her lover's happiness and peace of mind. You know I have always loved you. Why are you trying to hurt me? 
You know it is said of you that your love for me is like the love of a vain young nobleman for a prized thoroughbred horse. Is that what you think? <sighs> it's not what I think. It is what others have said. Well, if it is not what you think, why do you repeat it to me? I know you. You will never let me believe I am completely secure. You hold me to you by allowing me to fear that one day you will discard me. My brother is dead. Let us talk about things which matter. We began it. We are to blame. No. Life is possession. It belongs to the strongest. Hector is dead because he fought for glory or honor, but not to win. Agamemnon's men are not stronger than we are, but they are winning because they have more to lose. I was born to rule in Troy. But how could I rule? How could I honor Hera, the goddess of power, unless I killed my own brother and took his place? I left in only to follow Hera, and in only died for my sake. I chose to seek safety in the arms of Aphrodite. You became my throne, my empire, my fulfillment. And I loved you. But now, I shall be Priam's son. Father, try to sleep. I cannot. Sleep has deserted me. Sit with me, my son. It is not over. When you are gone, I will be king. No. When I am gone, only the carrion birds will live in this place. You will never be king. I know how you have longed for it. Beware. It will destroy you. I will be king. Not while I live. You are too old to fight. I am twice the man you are. I will destroy them. How? You cannot fight as he fought. <sighs> yeah. Now he's dead, he is a god. He was your brother. Do you feel nothing? Hector was your firstborn son, yet, even after forty years, he cringed under your rebuke, and you spoke almost to strangers. I would not have allowed you to treat me like that, even though you are my father. I would have demanded your respect, but he was honorable. And now you turn on me. What did you want from us? What did you expect us to be? You were hard and destructive, always, for all your fine words. How dare you criticize me? When we made war upon the Greek Confederation, we understood that they were strong, resolute, bold. What was our intention, if not to destroy them? I have said often in your hearing that by the way we managed this war, we have made it plain that we do not deserve to survive. For two years or longer, when they first came, we received their ambassadors and gave safe conduct to their heralds. When pestilence swept their army, we granted them a truce to cremate their dead. It is not their strength, but our weakness which holds them here and keeps us under siege. They know better than we seem to do that the history of a people begins with war. Oh, Father, every man and woman who lives in Troy is what you made them. You took a village people out of their huts and gave them ships, temples, markets, gardens and granaries. You did not do this because you loved them, but because it was in your ambition to do it. They followed you because you drove them hard. We must be now what you were in the old days. Harsh, pitiless, brutal, unrelenting. You talk of the old days, my son, but you were not there. I did what it was possible to do, no more. I know what is said by everyone except you that I am shiftless and effeminate, that my life has been lived in lethargy, hating the pursuits of manhood, thinking only of pleasure or women. It is said that because I was raised in poverty, I have been corrupted by luxury and ease. The truth is, I envied Hector. In my heart, I never thought him fit to be your heir. I wanted the crown which I knew you would one day pass to him. I am the son you have always wanted. I understand what my brother never did. What kingship is. And how the hearts of men are won by images. How they love magnificence in power. The gift of effortless preeminence. I have always known I will be king. Oh, you gods. 
Whatever we make, whatever we are ambitious for, you destroy. You teach us only that cruelty is rewarded, that justice does not exist, that in this life the evil man need not fear retribution. He may do everything his strength and power permits. No, Priam, you are wrong. Who are you? On the day your wife Hakabe died, I came before you in your palace. You were a king among kings. Every room, every corridor was laden with riches and wealth. You sat upon a throne, carved in marble, inlaid with amethyst, desolate and alone. You had power beyond price, but could not save your wife. I remember. Tell me why you have come. To speak the words of the gods. What do I care for the gods or their words? Did not my son Hector all his life show honor to the gods? Did he not make sacrifices to them and keep their feast days as they required of him? If you speak the words of the gods, say this to them, that they do not keep faith with those who love them. They show no loyalty to those who worship them. They are fickle and false. Do you think you were the first to lose a child in war? Do you think you were the first to see the things which you were proud to build destroyed and thrown down? Only children believe that life is fair. Only a child thinks it can be made right by prayer. Are you saying that because your son is dead and suffering exists, there are no gods? You do not believe in the gods or respect them if you think that they exist to give you what you want, to defend you against your enemies, to make your life happy and invulnerable? I do not know why the gods exist! All I know is that I suffer, and in my life it often seems to me I have known nothing except suffering upon suffering. If you are a god, if you speak their words, tell me now, how much more must I endure before my heart breaks and death sets me free? How much more? Grief has made you foolish, Priam. I cannot say. The truly good endure without a reason and without complaint. They know a man is not the master of his fate. Life is changeable and shifting. All is variance. Alone, the philosophic mind accepts this and learns that all which comes to pass is God-given and must be borne with patience. In your hour of desolation, I cannot comfort you. You are alone. You must find within yourself the strength to bear what mortal life must bear. Hector died as he had lived bravely in war, according to the commandments of manhood and duty. All men are free to take their own way. Hector was killed because he killed Patroclus, whom Achilles loved. Do you think that heaven would protect him against the anger of Achilles? His death does not mean the gods have no love for him. <laughs> what is death to the gods? Go to the tent of Achilles. You will find him asleep. Draw your sword and kill him. Because he killed the son you loved. Or else show him what suffering has taught you. Why are you here? Who brought you past the guards? 
The gods guided my steps. You put yourself in extreme danger. Yes, and you know why. Hector, my son, was a prince among men. I would have him buried as befits his rank. He killed my best loved friend. Men must learn to endure. I loved him. When he was in danger, you would not help him. How dare you say that? You are young, Achilles. You grieve as men do before they have known many griefs. But your father, Peleus, is an old man. You are the hope of his old age. Consider, Achilles, how Peleus, your father, will weep if you are returned to him as Hector must now be returned to me. He will wring his hands and say, For this I waited, arms open, the house prepared. For this I wore ten winters out with worry and care. You were my only son. Each spring I thought to see you returning at last to sit at my side. But the gods have had no pity for an old man's dream. Be silent, Priam. I have grief enough of my own. You were an old man. Old men are sentimental. They weep whenever they remember the past. They say the sun shone brighter in the old days. Ten years ago, when Helen was stolen from her lawful husband by your treacherous, dishonoured son, you made the choice between living in peace or waging war against those whom you had provoked. Do not blame me for the consequences of your own folly. I am here because an oath binds me in honour under Agamemnon's leadership. Yet consider, I have earned nothing from my long service. I have wasted my youth, strength and hope. Do not lie to yourself, Achilles. You came for gold and for the spoils of war. You thought it would be a short time before Troy fell, but you were overconfident. Go home. You are still a young man. If I go home, it will mean that Troy has fallen. Better for you if I were killed. When I came to your tent, Achilles, I made no noise. You lay asleep upon your couch and did not stir. Your bodyguards did not wake to protect or defend you. I might have taken my revenge. A voice inside me cried out, Kill him, Priam. Kill the man who slaughtered your son. But I could not kill you. I have a code of my own which I will not violate, whatever the provocation. Is this weakness in me? Do you despise me for it? Or would you have done as I have done? I despise you for what you did. But you are better than that. I cannot give you what you want. I was once a hard man, Achilles, a stubborn man. Yet I kissed these hands of yours, even though they killed the son I loved. Rise, Priam. I will not rise. I am an old man. There is little I have not seen in a long life. I know that nations which are great, as Troy has been great, are not destroyed by those who are better than they are. It is because we are higher than you, truer and more generous, that you desire to tear down our walls and plunder and burn our city. Then you would absorb into your own barbarian culture the best of what we taught the world. You will raise yourselves up upon our foundations. In time, some other nation, crueler, harder, more acquisitive than your own, will do to you what you did to us. But... These things lie in the future. We live in the present. You, Achilles, once sat as a guest at my table. You came to my city to learn what I could teach. I see now that I taught you nothing. You have murdered my son who rode beside you like a brother. Hatred should end with death, but you have no honour. When you expend your anger and bitterness upon his lifeless corpse, you punish only the living, his family, his wife, his father who loved him. 
The war is not about Helen. The war is about corn and trade. It is waged by a barbarian tribe out of envy and greed. The gods sent this war out of heaven as a curse. It must be endured. Take Hector's body. Take it. And give him burial. The law must be obeyed. You must have what you ask. I acted without honor or pity or common decency. Soon I will be dead. Better for me had I never come as a soldier to these shores. Better not to have been born. War should make us better than we are, not worse. Oh, you must be tired, Brian. I would be honored if you would sit at my table and eat and drink with me. Wine and food bring their own relief. No, Achilles. I can eat nothing until I see his body. It is here. it is to father children, to love them without reservation, to keep them at the centre of every thought, every dream, then to see them lying in the earth before their time. Does anything survive? At this moment, I do not believe so. Oh, that we could foretell the end of these events and in apprehension of what must befall us learn to bear it better. That we might see before beginning the ruination of our hope and youth and promise. That all our miseries might be revealed to us in the cradle so we could grow familiar with them and learn to call them by common names. Yet who, knowing this, would go a step further? Who, if he had a feeling of his own bereavement and death, would venture forth in this life at all? Who, knowing the distracted faculties of love, would hazard his sanity in its pursuit? We are wretched creatures, ignorant, Selfish and cruel. My life has gone by and the time has been wretchedly used. I have been ungentle and unloving and serving myself above all others. I have wasted my best days. In wine there is some oblivion, yet it does not last. In sleep there is some rest, yet it is not perfect. In memory there is some peace, yet it is fleeting. In love there is some ecstasy, yet it is changeable and shifting. Forgetfulness is ever denied us, for the imagination does not forget, except briefly but possesses its own iniquities to the end of consciousness, which, if the gods are kind, is death, as sleep secure and senseless, inanimate as the earth. Why do you weep, Achilles? Do you think it fit in the darkness to hide your tears of grief? For this at least I owe you thanks, that you gave back to my father the body of my brother, who was a better man than any in your army. I have no chivalry, Achilles. I obey no custom of war. If you had perished in your infancy, hundreds, thousands would live today to see the son who you have sent prematurely into darkness. I show you no respect. 
Because you deserve none! Come closer, Paris. I see that you still fear me. You carry sword, shield, bow, but I could take you with my bare hands. Look! For all your swiftness and agility, I can outrun you as the stag outruns the hounds. That you can outrun me and outfight me, Achilles, I do not doubt it. But you cannot outrun the arrow which I have marked for you! Helen, what is it? What has happened? Have courage. Paris is dying, Helen. He has been wounded in the hand by an arrow soaked in venom. His blood is poisoned. Nothing can help him, nothing in the world. He had gone out in search of Achilles. It seems that he knew or guessed where Achilles would be. He caught him alone shortly after dawn and killed him with an arrow which he had coated in snake venom. Paris had resolved, once Achilles was dead, to sever the head and carry it in front of him into Troy. But as he knelt to do it, it seems that he cut his own hand upon one of the arrows. He did not think even then that he was in danger, but his skin began to change colour. His breathing became short and fast. I must help him. I must be there to help him and comfort him. Take me to him. I must be with him when he dies. You will come too late. He will not recognise you. He does not remember you or his father or Troy itself. He is shouting for some girl. Some girl that he once knew whom he betrayed and deserted. Was there such a girl? I never heard him talk of this before. Her name was Eloni. When he's dead... They will bring you his body, and then you will be able to dress him for the funeral. You will tear your white robe, cut off your long hair, cover your face with ash, and we will all weep with you for him. Leave me. Leave me! I have lived like hot summer air. I have loved like the weather. My thoughts were as irresponsible as clouds. My affections as fierce as the wind. Now, in my grief, I have fallen like an apple on autumn leaves. A single night has bound my heart in ice. This is midwinter. I long to be clean and hard, bright and free, released from climate, season and mortality. If we cannot do it by force, brother, then let us do it by cunning. Since the Trojans desire to think that we're defeated, let us feed upon their hopes. Let us confirm the contemptuous opinion which they hold of us. And now that Achilles, the greatest and most prodigious of our fighting men, lies dead, let us appear weak and demoralized and superstitious. Let us depart under cover of night, leaving behind us on their beaches only a single votive image to placate the angry gods, whom by our lawlessness and strife we have affronted. Mm. Thus Troy will be taken, not by an engine of war, but by an image of peace. 
the emblem of Poseidon, the sea god, a horse made of poplar wood, 10 or 15 feet in height, and inside as hollow as a laundry basket. Within it we will conceal two or more of our soldiers. The Trojans, out of their piety, will transport the horse within the walls of their city, and once they're asleep or drunk, our men will emerge. One will light a beacon, signalling our fleet to return, and the other will open the heavy gates of Troy to admit our invading army. So shall be taken the holy city of Priam. He made it to stand forever, firm against the ages. Yet in a single night, every part of it will burn. I have often imagined how Troy will fall. And in my grief, I've often prayed for death. Desired it, amorously, to be a second husband to me. And I have longed to be set free in sleep. Last night, in a dream... I walked beside a river where the scent of flowers fell heavy on the air. And in that silent place, Hector walked beside me. The shock of death had not yet left his face. Hear me, he said. My time is short, Andromache. Take the boy and hide him in another country. Troy will soon fall, and they will leave no part of it large enough to hide a child. <laughs> but I cannot take my son out of the city his father loved. His death will be the end of me. But he is Hector's child. <laughs> and dreams are not real. They are only dreams. And I must endure what the wife of Hector must endure. There are no choices left for me. Yet, I shall beg them to spare his life. Agamemnon will answer me. Andromache, do not be a fool. The day will soon come when this boy will be a man. And then, as a good son should, he'll seek revenge. Blood will have blood. When a man dies bravely in battle for his gods and country, he is loved, even in his death. And all men weep for him. But for the widow he leaves defenceless, the child orphaned, there is no chivalry. Truly it is said that the family of a brave man weeps often. But for me, death will be like the moment when at last the storm blows itself out and the sky clears and the light is clean. They leave behind them a horse constructed from poplar wood, in height as tall as three men, four paces in breadth. A votive offering to Poseidon, the sea god. No nation being more superstitious than the Greeks. Why 
do you not rejoice to see the beaches cleared at last of soldiers? To hear from your people only the sounds of laughter and joy? Is it because so many have died? Is it because the two sons you loved and honored are both dead? I love them too, Brian. I will not sing or drink wine tonight. I cannot rejoice. No, Helen, that is not the reason. I feel no joy because in my heart I know that their fleet will be back once the winter storms are over. I know that Agamemnon has the means to refit his ships, to take in provisions, to make himself richer and stronger. Everyone in this city blames me for what Troy has been compelled to endure at Agamemnon's hands. Either behind my back or now openly they speak against me. Everyone, except you, Priam. You never blamed me. You have always been kind and gentle towards me. It is said, everyone says it, that you knew Troy would be destroyed if Paris lived. Were you not afraid when he returned from Sparta, bringing me to Troy as his lover? I was afraid. But not for his sake and not for yours. I should have made war on Agamemnon before he had had time to launch his fleet. I should have demanded obedience from the Greek states, and when they refused it, I should have accused them of spurning my friendship and then attacked them. I think now that the years when Troy was at peace weakened my resolve. When I was a young man, I did not hesitate to take whatever measures were necessary to restore order. The times were harsh. I taught my enemies it was not wise to fight with Priam. But I lived to be old. And as old men do, I began to think too much. I saw that no life is lived which does not end in failure. Accordingly, I failed to punish with appropriate severity those who threatened my interests. I was strong, but not strong enough. They will win for this reason, Helen. They hit harder than we do. They bear pain better. No, Brian. I think you have defeated them. I think they know that they have failed. Do not abjure your love songs nor forget to make of life one everlasting day. Believe the world was made for humankind, and that in your own image it was framed, and that to fit your loveliest desires it has no other purpose, no, nor truth. Worship the rose and never fear to love the perfect beauty of an imperfect girl. We come from nothing and are gone like smoke. We cannot answer questions, never know why we are born to die, or why we live in this and not some other space of time. This spark which kindles us will soon be out. And out. We never light its flame again. And the next night after, at about the third hour of the morning, the army of the Greeks took Troy as they had purposed and intended for so long. The Trojans, for their part, kept no watch, nor did they think any man would have come in and assaulted them, since, as they thought, the Greek ships were gone, and their whole army departed. The Greek soldiers, entering into the city of Troy, 
despoiled both houses and temples, slew the inhabitants without mercy on young or old alike, but killed all they could light on, even the laboring cattle. Priam, offering no resistance to the soldiers, died upon the steps of his own palace. As Dionax, the child of Hector, was not suffered to live, being thrown alive from the tower above the chief gate. When day came, soldiers laid the body of the dead, one across another, in carts, and carried them outside the city to be burned. And of their wives and women folk, as many as were taken alive, they made bond slaves of them. In Troy by Andrew Rissick, Achilles was played by Toby Stevens, Aegistos by James Hayes, Agamemnon by Oliver Cotton, and Anacreon by Ian Hogg. Andromache was Emma Fielding, Electra Cassandra Sperry, Hecabe Deborah Findlay, Hector Michael Maloney, Helen Geraldine Somerville, and Hermes Paul Schofield. Clytemnestra was Lindsay Duncan, Menelaus, James Lawrenson, Nicanor, Geoffrey Whitehead, Enoni, Abigail Doherty, Orestes, Jean-Marc Perret, and Paris, Michael Sheen. Saeed Jaffrey played Parmenion, David Harewood, Patroclos, Julian Glover, Priam, and Eleanor Braun, Thetis. The singer was Mio Soteriu, and the producer was Jeremy Mortimer. 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 Mortimer, 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 Mortimer.